And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to another episode of All of the Above, the show that gives you an unstandardized take on education. I'm Jeffrey Garrett, one of your co-hosts, along with... Manuel Rustin, your favorite teacher's favorite teacher. And if you're tuning in on YouTube, please remember to hit that subscribe button. And if you're listening to the podcast version of this episode, do know that you are missing out on my fancy black tie, mm. which was a gift from my wife for the first day of school several years ago. And um, it's special and all that, and you're missing it. But thank you for tuning in. <laughs> now, we are excited to have you back, and we've got another great episode for you today. We've got a special guest contributor for today's show and tell, which is an exciting new addition to the show. And for today's seminar, we'll be joined by some dynamic experts to explore issues around school safety and preventing violence in schools. In a world where folks are talking about arming teachers and hiring more police and hardening facilities, what's the best way to ensure our schools are safe? But first, we dive into some headlines in education in today's warm -up. According to a new study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, the suicide rate among young black children aged 5 to 12 years old is roughly double the rate of white children in that same age group. This comes despite the fact that, during the teenage years, the suicide rate among black youth is about 50% lower than it is among white youth. Suicide is most certainly a major public health problem in the United States, and it's the second leading cause of death among American teens. The authors of the study, Drs. Jeffrey Bridge, Lisa Horowitz, and Cynthia Fontanea, write that their findings, quote, provide further evidence of a significant age-related racial disparity in childhood suicide. The study does not explore the question of why the suicide rate among young black children is higher, but the authors are planning to look at potential factors. These include the availability of health care and community resources, attitudes towards mental health care, and the potential impact on children of higher homicide rates among older black adolescents. In a CBS News article by Ashley Welch, UCLA Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences professor Jean Miranda says that this racial disparity may be due to a multitude of factors. She explains that our American legacy of racism has resulted in less access to mental health services for black youth, a shortage of black professionals who offer mental health services, and a disproportionately high level of exposure to trauma and harmful zero tolerance practices which negatively impact black children. Jeff, what do these findings mean for our schools? Well, uh, first, Manuel, I have to say that just hearing some of these statistics is really heartbreaking. Uh, the thought of a five-year-old who's suicidal is, uh, you know, difficult to wrap my mind around. Um, I will say that uh, to me, what this uh, perhaps speaks to is the compounding uh, kind of traumatic issues in our history. So we've made a lot of progress as a country, but um, for our youngest kids, uh, particularly in the in the most impacted communities. Um, you know, what we're seeing is the children who are now the descendants of two or three generations of the war on drugs, uh, the, the resulting issues with chemical dependency, mass incarceration, over policing, right? Um, the, the gutting of funding uh, for public education and some other public institutions. And so I think what this is screaming out, these children are kind of the canaries in the, in the mine, if you will, and telling us that even though we've made some progress in other ways, and you know, it's great that Obama was president, but um, we've got some real work to do and a definite need for greater investment um, for social and emotional supports and mental health supports uh, in our highest need communities. Yeah, and I look forward to further studies to learn more about the causes behind this disparity, but you're, you're spot on with no, no matter what we find, we know that there is a need for greater investment in these services. So, um, you know, just another, another uh, sign that we need to do more and do better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Next up, we turn to a story about mathematics. Now, there's a quiet revolution brewing in the field of math that could revolutionize the landscape of math curriculum in American high schools. And it's spreading faster than you might think. This, at least according to an EdSource article by Pamela Birdman, founder of Just Equations, an organization that promotes equal opportunity for math education. 
This year in Los Angeles, 21 of the district's 100 comprehensive high schools began offering an introduction to data science course, which challenges the traditional high school math sequence of algebra one, geometry, algebra two, and then calculus at the top of the hill. And LA isn't alone. There are six other California districts piloting this curriculum and several states across the country that are placing greater emphasis on statistics and data science in their high school curricula. The expansion of opportunities to meet the requirements of the Common Core Standards, as well as college entrance requirements, comes at a time in history when people are just inundated with data. From the daily news, to your cell phone, to your Fitbit, we not only engage with statistical analyses and interpretations of data almost daily, but we also generate large quantities of personal data that are being used to inform the experience we have online and in many parts of the real world. The greater emphasis on data science and statistics seeks to empower young people to find new pathways to develop quantitative literacy that have perhaps a better answer to the age old question math teachers hear from students and parents alike, which goes something like, but why do we have to learn this? I'm never gonna use this in real life, am I? So instead of dumbing down the curriculum and teaching some students only rote memorization and so-called business math that empowers students to do little more than function as consumers, a focus on statistics and data science, advocates argue, would engage students in rigorous college preparatory thinking that remains firmly rooted in math that is practically applicable to daily life. Now, Manuel, I can already hear the math purists in my head saying, no, Algebra 2 and Calculus are vital to students being able to pursue careers in STEM, and they teach kids how to think critically. We can't undo this. Um, but is this possible revolution in mathematics a good thing? Well, as a history teacher, I could say that this is definitely not something that I know much about in terms of this new math, but I know there is a big debate out there about whether or not this is the direction for us to go. And when I uh, observe comments, especially on Facebook about math instruction, I see a lot of people hearkening back to the way they were taught and it worked for them and, and what's going on here. But I think the data is pretty clear that our uh, math achievement in the United States as compared with other countries has been um, definitely uh, left a lot more um, for us to uh, hope for and wish for because we definitely have not been performing at the level that we would hope and aspire to perform at. So any change in the math curriculum, I think, if anything, um, it's something that we have to you know, look at with some uh, a level of seriousness because um, our existing curriculum hasn't done it. I mean, I went through you know, Algebra 1, Geometry, uh, Trig, Calculus, and all that. I don't remember much from my calculus class, and I know that I'm told that it you know, helped me think critically, but um, the point is, like, what has been done in the past, just because it worked for you as an individual doesn't mean it's working um, for our students nowadays. And with technology being what it is, what you mentioned about the amount of data collection and, and from Fitbits to whatever else, we need to rethink how we approach mathematics for sure. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because not that Algebra 2 and Calculus are bad, right? But um, we now live in a world in which we are inundated with information that requires quantitative literacy with data in so many ways. Uh, you know, electoral maps and, uh, you know, personal health monitoring apps and all these things. And we need to be literate in these things in order to use the devices and the tools we have in our life. And so if for that reason alone, it's interesting that schools are thinking about how to help our kids be literate in that kind of world. Right. And with you said 21 out of 100 of LAUSD's comprehensive high schools piloting this, I mean, I think we should be able to see, in, you know, over the next couple of years uh, whether or not this is making a difference. And I mean, you know, it's, it's worth a shot and it's, you know, 21 out of 100 schools. I think there's going to be a pretty a massive data set that uh, just might require some uh, data <laughs> literacy there uh, uh, to take a look at. That was, so, that was yeah. next level. I like yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now for our third warm-up story. Um, this is about charter schools, particularly online charter schools. Online charter schools, which are known by some as cyber charters or virtual schools, have been in the news for all the wrong reasons lately. In a recent Education Week post, Benjamin Herald reviews the spate of closures occurring among the cyber charter community across the nation. Herald points out that online charters in several states are facing closure, most notably the Electronic Classroom of Tomorrow in Ohio, the state's largest virtual school. 
Jesse Baumert for Cincinnati.com reports that multiple audits found that the Electronic Classroom of Tomorrow was getting money for over 9,000 students without proof that those students existed or that they were learning anything. The series of negative audits of the school resulted in the state asking for its money back to a tune of roughly $80 million. ECOT closed in January due to an inability to pay these funds back. Benjamin Herald's Ed Week article quotes Greg Richmond, the president and CEO of the National Association of Charter School Authorizers, as saying in a statement, quote, across the country, virtual schools are costing taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars each year for providing little or no education to most of their students. Well, it's not all bad news for cyber charters. Business Wire reports that in Oregon, a new statewide full-time online charter school called Cascade Virtual Academy will begin serving students in kindergarten through eighth grade from across the state for the 2018-2019 school year. So Jeff, where is all this heading? Well, I think uh, the answer is a little bit complex because uh, on the one hand, the type of stories that you just uh, were revealing shows a major issue uh, in our field, which is that um, accountability, particularly for online charters, is, is not very well developed. And um, at least what I see and hear is reporting that shows that uh, there's sort of little information out there until there's a big scandal that's revealed, right? right. And there's 9,000 kids that no one can find. Um, but there are some good online charter schools that I am familiar with and know mm -hmm. people who work in that, that are providing valuable service, particularly um, in rural areas where there uh, maybe aren't large comprehensive schools schools that can offer a very diverse curricula, um, particularly when students might be suffering with um, intense medical needs and be homebound but still need to, uh, you know, engage in school and being in an online environment still provides at least some aspect of the kind of social component of school. Uh, so there's, the, you know, it doesn't mean we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater, uh, but I think certainly the need for greater oversight, the need for real scrutiny around online operators is something that uh, it seems self-evident from these kinds of stories. Yeah, and you know, I think your um, favorite Secretary of Education of all time, uh, Betsy all DeVos, time. Um, definitely is a supporter of the Charter Movement and School Choice, so these virtual um, online schools, I don't think are in any uh, significant danger in the uh, broad scheme of things. And I agree that a lot of these schools, and I know teachers who um, have worked for um, online, online schools, um, a lot of them are offering great work and great help for students, in particular uh, students who can't access um, local schools for one reason or another. One of the highest achieving students that I ever had, uh, most of his secondary education came from an online charter school mm -hmm. before he uh, came to the school where I work at. And you know that online charter school really helped him out and really helped him stay on track with other students. Um, so there are definitely great examples out there. And you know negative headlines, I think, are um, something that are troubling for whether it's charter schools or traditional public schools. You know these negative headlines get out there and reinforce people's uh, perceptions of schooling. But you know it's not all bad, and I think it's important for us to continue to speak towards trying to make sure that they are held accountable and that no one is making up fraudulent students or fake yeah. students that don't or, go there. 9,000 of them. 9,000 <laughs> of them at that. Um, so obviously accountability is something that we gotta uh, continue to work on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, so that's it for today's warm up. And next up is a special show and tell segment with a very important special guest. All right, welcome to the show and tell. For today's episode, we have the first guest contributor for our show and tell, and this is Nadia El Hawari. She is a dope educator who's taught in Los Angeles, Chicago, San Jose, Oakland, and she's now pursuing her master's in school counseling. Nadia, welcome to the show. What did you bring to show us today? For today's show and tell, I brought in my third grade portfolio from 2001. Just this week, I found my portfolio that I created and it was based on the narrative that Christopher Columbus was a good man who kissed the ground when he arrived to shore. Where everyone woke up and began cheering and the redskin people came to the shore with excitement. This represents the dominant narrative, but more specifically, the white man's narrative that perpetrates white supremacy within our schools and history books. This is the content that I am constantly and actively unlearning as a 26 year old woman. This is the white supremacy 
and dominant narrative, I was fed and I am constantly having to unlearn to ensure I am not further perpetrating this within my work both as a teacher and as a counselor. I am continuously challenging this narrative. When we think about white supremacy, we think of the most overt instances such as the KKK and the alt-right. However, the term white supremacy also, also refers to dominant culture of whiteness continuously being maintained through interactions, norms, language, and the curriculum within our education system. While recently listening to J. Cole's newest album, K.O.D., I noticed his song Brackets, summarizing perfectly what I had been reflecting on. But my people barely graduate, they ain't got the tools. Maybe because the tax dollars that I make sure I send got spent hiring some teachers that don't look like them. And the curriculum be tricking them the dollars I send got us learning about the heroes with the whitest of skin. One thing about the men that's controlling the pen that write history, they always seem to white out their sins. Cole was speaking the truth around how white supremacy is maintained in the education system, how teachers rarely look like us and students are taught myths. We are taught the dominant narrative that tells the oppressor side of the story, which are usually sugar-coated versions of history around colonization and imperialism, rather than the stories of the marginalized and oppressed people who are impacted by it. We are also taught to glorify people who commit horrific acts of violence on people of color. J. Cole talks about how our taxes are spent on hiring teachers who don't look like them, meaning white teachers who don't look like the majority black and brown children who they teach in urban schools, where white women make up over 80% of teachers. Representation is important, and hiring and recruiting more teachers of color is essential. However, while I acknowledge how powerful it is for young people to see me in the classroom as a brown woman, the bigger issue needs to be addressed which is that teachers of color can uphold white supremacist ideals and mindsets that are harmful to young people. Through my experience teaching and training new teachers, I have observed how teachers of color have been conditioned to think challenging whiteness is too radical and too revolutionary. While teaching recently as a long-term sub for US history class in Oakland, California, which is considered very progressive when it comes to education, I recognize the sugar-coated history I was expected to teach our young people. Even the new history books that are considered progressive are still problematic, and they don't serve the interests of marginalized people. This experience made me reflect on my own educational journey and how white supremacy was so embedded within the curriculum through my academic journey. Instead of staying quiet about it, I would bring the issue of whitewashing history to the forefront. When bringing up how whiteness dominated the material I was teaching, I was met with resistance. I was met with feedback about how teaching content around race and history is divisive and how I should keep the topic of race and ethnicity out of the classroom. I continue to push for students to think critically about the book and the content that we are expected to know and learn. I created opportunities for dialogue where students were engaged and excited and they were, they were critical of what they were reading rather than absorbing everything and memorizing it without questioning it. Whiteness is such a taboo topic that even while gathering my thoughts to bring in for this show, I had to question, is my topic even appropriate to even speak about or is it too risky? People are so concerned with white fragility that they often try to gloss over how detrimental the effects of whitewash curriculum is on young people. While teaching history to an eighth grade class this year, there was a piece in the content that stated, slavery brought out the worst of human nature. Slave owners might have been kind men, but slavery made them become cruel. I was expected to teach this to a class of brown kids. Instead, I made an entire lesson around breaking this line down. I talked to students about how one line attempts to humanize people who have enslaved, killed, and raped people who look like me and the young people I serve. Yet again, our ancestors' truths are left out of the curriculum. This is a perfect example of the oppressors writing the dominant narrative that is depicted within the history books, and we can't allow this to continue to happen. One way to combat this would be to first, make whiteness a less taboo topic, allow teachers to speak about whiteness, encourage dialogue with race with students. It is 2018, let's be real, race, ethnicity, gender, ability, sexuality, class, and intersectionalities as a whole must be discussed for the sake of our current diversity in this country and fostering true understanding of ourselves and our history in America. This also means engaging students in understanding the dominant narratives and using that not only to flip the script, but also write counter narratives to combat those dominant narratives. Administration and other staff must actively support teachers in breaking down curriculum 
and actively changing it rather than just viewing teachers as passive actors in teaching curriculum. If we continue to stay quiet and not challenge white supremacy in schools, we will continue to see the creation of portfolios like this. And that's my show and tell for today. Wow, Nadia, uh, just an incredibly powerful uh, framing of an issue that uh, that I think you really added some depth to that mm -hmm. we have touched on in a few previous episodes. Um, and uh, I think what you really helped surface is a few very, very important ideas. One, that uh, the issues around confronting whiteness in the classroom aren't just about diversity in the teaching profession, although that is important, but that even teachers of color can mm -hmm. either consciously grapple with, like, is this a topic that I can bring up? What's safe for me to bring up? Um, will I be ostracized in some way if I do? Um, and can unconsciously perpetuate the same uh, aspects of kind of the whitewashing of history that mm -hmm. um, we might, you know, consciously want to undo, but we're using textbooks and materials that uh, that might lead us in a different direction. So really appreciated that. And then I think, um, you know, just the idea that uh, as an institution of learning, um, as, uh, you know, an institution in public life that is not only about kind of educating kids and helping them meet standards, but also creating citizens in our world who can be, uh, you know, the best representations of our values and, uh, you know, the kind of country and place that we hope and aspire to be. We're not going to get there if we're not willing and uh, able to, and if we don't create the space for the kind of teaching and kind of discourse that I think you named very eloquently um, in, your, in your show and tell today. So, so thank you so much for thank that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, so first of all, dope portfolio. If those of you, uh, those of you who are just listening to the podcast version, make sure you hit the YouTube channel and see this portfolio for yourself. It's giant and it's dope, minus the white supremacy aspect of it. Laminated. Um, laminated, yeah, dope lamination and like got the block lettering and all that. Very cool, very cool. Uh, thank you for bringing that in. Um, it definitely brings to mind some stories that have been in the headlines recently about basically um, different ways that white supremacy has been reinforced, particularly with lessons regarding slavery and, you know, there's teachers, there was a recent teacher who uh, had an extra credit assignment where students were asked to think about runaway, a runaway slave from the perspective of a slave owner and write a little fictionalized uh, poster about how they lost their slave and what have you, really humanizing the slave owner aspect of it and dehumanizing the uh, enslaved person's aspect of it. Um, there's that teacher in Florida who had her white supremacist mm -hmm. podcast and you know, had several episodes rolling before her identity was found out. So, I mean, this is definitely an issue that needs to be addressed and needs to be uh, discussed critically throughout our nation in, in all levels, not just high schools, but elementary schools as well. I mean, this is mm -hmm. a third grade project where Christopher Columbus was this great hero who, um, you know, discovered these red skinned people. And this is 2001, like this isn't yeah. like, you know, some something from like the 40s or 50s, like this is recent curriculum and it's still going on. So um, thank you very much for, for being our guest contributor and for bringing your portfolio and um, love to have you on, on the show again. Thank you. I appreciate you both for inviting me. We've all been gripped by the headlines and gut-wrenching images of shootings at American schools. From Columbine and Newtown to Virginia Tech, Parkland, and so many more in between, there's been a growing and disturbing trend of incidents of mass violence at American schools. Since the year 2000, there have been over 190 school shootings at schools and universities. The exact number is difficult to pin down since the federal government does not collect official statistics or study this issue. In those events, more than 200 students have been killed and more than 200 others have been wounded. This puts the United States far atop the troubling list of nations that have had incidents of mass violence on school grounds. And while those numbers are sobering, the ripple effect of these incidents may be more widespread than it seems. The Washington Post estimates that since the year 2000, over 187,000 students have directly experienced incidents of mass violence in American schools, the traumatic toll of which will be felt for decades to come. Students and teachers now attend school in a context where lockdown drills are commonplace and where many students wonder not if an incident might happen at their school, but when. In the current political climate, thanks largely to the organized efforts of the students from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, 
pressure and scrutiny on politicians to act is at an all-time high. But despite this broad attention, there is little agreement about what the solution is. The wide range of ideas being debated across the nation includes large-scale gun control measures, boosting the number of armed security personnel at schools, investing in our mental health services, arming teachers, strengthening anti-bullying campaigns, expanding restorative justice practices, and hardening school facilities through measures like installing bulletproof glass, using metal detectors, installing doors that lock from the inside, and even installing countermeasures to stun and limit the mobility of an active shooter on campus. Now, American schools are performing by most measures. Graduation and college acceptance rates, for example, these are at all-time historic highs. And there are many excellent schools across the country providing fantastic learning environments for students. Nonetheless, we are faced with this undeniable crisis. Shootings and mass violence at American schools happen far more frequently than anywhere else on Earth and with deadlier consequences. The question we tackle today is, with incidents of mass violence in American schools at epidemic proportions and with no clear policy solutions on the horizon, what is the best way for us to ensure safety at our schools? Well, for today's seminar, we are joined by two wonderful guests. Uh, I'm incredibly happy to have both of these folks here, uh, not only because we're going to have a great discussion, but also on a personal level, they're people that um, I know well and I think have a great deal uh, to offer our discussion. So uh, furthest from my left, let me introduce Yulia Zubak. Uh, Yulia is the manager of restorative communities at the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools. In that role, she supports a network of public schools in LA implementing restorative practices. So that has to do with building a healthy school culture and addressing harm and conflict when it happens. She supports teachers and school leaders. And uh, before joining the partnership in that role, she has a background as a former high school social studies teacher uh, here in the Los Angeles area. Um, immediately to my left uh, is Mauro Bautista. Uh, Mauro is principal of the Felicitas and Gonzalo Mendez High School, um, which is uh, an incredible school. It has a great transformation story of going from being one of Los Angeles's lowest performing high schools to one of Los Angeles's highest performing high schools, especially among non-magnet schools. Um, Mendez is also uh, coincidentally known as the happiest place on earth um, and has put a lot of work into building a healthy school culture. Um, and now boasts a 94% uh, graduation rate. And when he's not uh, busy being principal, uh, Mauro also teaches in the UCLA Principal Leadership Institute as well. Um, so welcome both uh, Mauro and Yulia. Uh, we're really excited to have you here today. Uh, and I think I'd like to start off with a question of, you know, in a world where um, we continue to see uh, just really graphic stories in the headlines about school shootings and, um, you know, these incidents of, of mass violence. There's more attention than ever on what do we do to fix this problem. Um, but how do we go about creating uh, mm -hmm. the kind of school culture we need to address this problem? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, certainly there's a lot of dialogue right now nationally about what to do and there's people that argue that we should actually harden the schools. Um, part of what hardening looks like is uh, continuing with the, such policies like, like LAUSD metal, daily metal uh, detector surge or installing metal detectors as students walk in. At the same time, there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> researchers out there that actually argue that what needs to happen is actually softening uh, the schools and that means a lot of things but among the many things that it means is how is that it's important for schools to develop positive school culture now the phrase school culture gets thrown out a lot well, what exactly does it mean to have a positive school culture uh, is, is something that I think administrators and school communities struggle with I'll only talk about one element but there's many at least I'll, I'll talk about one element now and then as the discussion continues I'm sure there are other elements or, or, or we will discuss other elements as well. I think one, ele one important element of having a positive school culture is when students feel connected. Mm. Uh, when they feel connected to the school and or when they feel connected to adults on the campus 
and or if they feel connected to other students on the campus. And so there's numerous ways of helping students feel connected, but among, um, among the ways is to be able to have uh, programs uh, that really fit what the students are looking for. Um, so, you know, in the year 2018, we're coming out of an era in the late 2000s when a lot of extracurricular programs were cut, a lot of arts programs were cut, and there was a huge focus on ELA and math. And um, obviously, uh, the schools function to help students achieve academically. Uh, but in addition to that, students feel connected when they're able to join an athletic team, for example, when they're able to join an academic team, such as the Academic Decathlon, mm -hmm. when they're able to be part of an arts program, whether it be music, uh, visual art, performing art, uh, or dance, uh, when they're able to start their own clubs or be part of clubs that are already established. Um, and the more opportunities that students have to connect to their own uh, uh, personal likes, then students begin to meet other students who they might not have otherwise met. If they both go to mm -hmm. uh, a club that exists on campus, two individuals who may not have otherwise come together because they're not in the same grade level, they would not have taken the same classes, all of a sudden come together and there's a friendship that's formed. At the same time, through these uh, programs that exist at schools, you have adults who are sponsoring those programs, adults who invest a lot of time and energy uh, before school, during school, after school, and many times students make connections with those adults and those adults become uh, incredible allies and advocates uh, for students. And so instead of hardening the schools, one way that schools can help make uh, the setting safer is to provide opportunities for students to feel connected, for them to feel connected to the school, to other adults on campus, and to other students on campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would definitely um, agree with Mauro. I think that um, really the, the writing on the wall um, is that we need community schools, right? And I think um, what's really needed is, um, is the public health approach, right? And I don't think this is a popular answer, right? People want easy solutions. I think people really want um, certainty, right? That our children are going to be safe. And I do understand that our greatest fear, right, is of another school shooting happening. Um, and so I know that parents are very much uh, hungry for, for quick solutions uh, and for certainty. Um, unfortunately, I think what the experts are saying, right, and what the research says is that uh, it's not that simple and it's not as simple as putting more police in schools or having the metal detectors, right, but really that um, what works, right, is a more preventative approach. And so um, the idea with, uh, with the public health approach is that you are trying to uh, create conditions that are going to minimize the chances um, of violence happening um, on that school campus, right? And I completely agree that um, a connection with the adults is really important, right? Because we need that trust there between the students and the adults um, so that when there is a threat, um, they're, they're, they feel comfortable and safe going to those adults. Um, because what we see really is that young people are very much aware um, of the threats that, that do show up on our campuses and they know um, way before any adult um, is aware. And so we can't have a culture where snitching is seen as a bad thing. Um, I think in many of our schools, we do have that culture, unfortunately. Um, but I think the schools like Mendes um, have created an environment where really uh, there is trust and there's a, there's a true culture of care among um, the adults and the students on the campus. Um, I do think that there are precautions that schools can take, right? I think it's important to not have too many points of entry into the school, right? In order to have someone um, welcoming every visitor, right? I think it's important to, to take precautions. Uh, but the reality is that, um, you know, locking our schools up and, and uh, bringing more weapons onto the campus is, um, is not the solution. And I think so. Julia brings up an, an important point. It's, um, it was part of, I think, the National Public Radio article that um, we got a chance to read. Uh, before today's show, in which it states that when students feel 
that they can go to an adult on campus or there's other opportunities for them to share what they know when they feel that there's a threat, um, it minimizes potential harm. And so um, there's different ways that, sc that schools could do it. Definitely being proactive is, is the best way. Um, more and more schools are being proactive by having restorative uh, justice coordinators now on campuses. And part of their responsibilities is to go into classrooms and give lessons, different types of lessons, but among them um, just lessons about who, who, they, who students can go to if they feel that uh, someone's, and not just uh, a weapon on campus, right, but he, someone's being uh, bullied, if someone's being bullied physically or online, if there's an issue on campus, maybe a certain uh, place on campus where issues are arising, for example, the boys' pee locker room, and even a specific period, maybe right after lunch, period five, uh, something's happening in the boys' locker room. Um, and so these restorative justice coordinators who do these proactive lessons, in addition also, I think um, schools try to do their best to create this environment where if you tell an adult, it isn't seen as snitching, but mm -hmm. among uh, young adolescents, that could be a, a great pressure where even if they want to go to an adult, if someone else finds out, they might feel like, oh, they're gonna consider me a snitch or they're gonna um, you know, lose trust or lose respect for me. And so uh, different schools have started anonymous uh, phone uh, tip lines where students can text uh, what they are seeing or what they're feeling, even online anonymous uh, opportunities for them to share uh, what's going on. Mm -hmm. That, in my opinion, is much more effective than, for example, like a random wanding of students that disrupts instructional time. And, you know, in, in LAUSD, where the great majority of students are brown and black, it criminalizes brown and black youth. I mean, this uh, policy that LAUSD has doesn't exist in other school districts. Mm -hmm. So then to that point, um, you mentioned that the public wants quick fixes. Um, there were so many school shootings just this past year that grabbed so many headlines that members of the public who aren't educators, they want something that they could point to that helps them feel better about their own child's safety. Um, so restorative practices and school climate, these things take time to develop on the campus. Are there any other solutions in terms of on the, in the short term that you think are appropriate or are there wrong ideas out there that you think we definitely need to avoid when it comes to a quick fix? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that there are certain things we can do that wouldn't take too much time, um, but it really takes a lot of political will, right? And so, for example, increasing the number of counselors, uh, PSWs, uh, social workers in a school campus, right? That doesn't have to take um, multiple years, right? But what does take, what that does take is an adjustment of, of your budgets, right? And so, and what we see now um, in LAUSD specifically is the millions are spent on uh, school police, right? Uh, but way less is spent on programs like restorative justice or on mental health in schools, right? And the reality in our society, right, where we have um, a society that's actually very lonely, right? We don't have the best preventative healthcare system um, out there. We have a lot of trauma, right? We have what I call these kind of internal war zones in, in our poorest communities. And then we, in the suburbs, we have a lot of very kind of isolated youth, right? Who, um, are, are suffering um, from that isolation. So I think that, um, you know, the, the fix really, it doesn't have to take years, right? But it, again, it has to, uh, you know, we need political will. Um, the other thing I would say is that certain things that are not going to work, um, arming teachers is certainly not going to work in my humble opinion. Um, as someone who has a teaching credential um, and as someone who actually is, um, is a war survivor and uh, someone who's lived through a lot of trauma, um, I certainly do not feel equipped as an educator to carry a weapon. I think that our, my students would be, um, our students would be really frightened if our teachers were armed, um, especially in a country really where the majority of the teaching force um, is white. And now we see in our public schools, um, the majority of our students are students of color. Um, and there's sometimes tension between our students and our, our, um, our staff. And the last thing that we wanna see 
um, is our students feeling, f feeling fearful um, of an armed teacher. Um, so I think that the possibility for accidents there um, is just huge, and I think that's one really dangerous idea. Um, so I would, I'll stop there mm -hmm. <laughs> and let Mauro add anything. Yeah, I think another opportunity for school is to have Im immediate positive impact is the communication that schools have with families. So families, for instance, currently uh, school shootings is, is at the forefront of parents who are sending their child to elementary, middle, or high school. Um, and another component of school safety that is constantly on a parent's mind at all levels is also bullying, right? whether it be physical bullying or cyberbullying. And schools can be very proactive about how they communicate with families, which will also help a ton because families have questions about, okay, what is the school doing to ensure that my daughter's son is safe and that they're not gonna get uh, attacked by a weapon, right? whether it be a gun or a knife or anything else. They're also asking questions about, okay, if my son or daughter is being bullied, then what is the school doing? So schools can be proactive in addressing those questions instead of waiting until something happens and then having to react. So the different ways that schools can do it, of course, is throughout the school year, there's numerous um, parent meetings for various topics, but throughout the school year, uh, schools can constantly remind families what the school is doing to ensure that their son or daughter is safe. And I think it addresses a, a lot of concerns, especially if in a meeting uh, a family may bring up uh, a very general comment that could possibly rile up other parents, such as, you know, I was, I was here the other day and there was no one at the front door and anyone can come in, mm -hmm. and that happens all the time. Schools in these meetings can address that and say, well, actually we have a policy where there's always uh, someone at the front door. If you happen to pass by and there was nobody there, it's so definitely an isolated incident, but then with the parents all there, you could remind the parents, for example, when you guys came in yesterday, when you guys came in this morning, last week you normally have to sign in and there's, there's usually somebody there. In terms of um, bullying or cyberbullying, um, the more information parents have, the better. So for example, go to people in case they feel their son or daughter is being bullied. Uh, direct li You can share direct lines, so instead of having to go through the automated phone lines that could take a while and just fluster people, just say, look, here's your, counsel here's your child's counselor, here's the direct line, you know, please give them a call, direct line to the office. Mm -hmm. So family and community engagement is, uh, I think, for many schools, I think many schools acknowledge that a strong family and community engagement program is key for many things, not just school safety, for academic achievement as well, of course. Uh, but the work that it takes to create a strong family and community engagement program is, uh, is, is very difficult. And so a lot of times it's given lip service. But when done right, a strong family and community relation, a, a strong family and community engagement program mm -hmm. can help with school safety. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of really powerful statements you guys uh, shared there that, that as an educator resonate with me and uh, it's making me think that um, in so much of the discussions we're having nationally about this issue, I think some of the solutions that are proposed like let's arm all the teachers um, seem as an educator and as a more maybe more progressive minded educator to be so crazy and so um, just obviously absurd that it's almost a little bit hard to to explain why it's crazy. Um, it just feels like uh, wrong in my gut, right? Um, but I think it's interesting to think about the um, the incentives that are at work for policymakers, right? Because we maybe as educators can know and relate to the idea that um, you know. Uh, investing in counseling and building great relationships with families and mm -hmm. doing these preventative things that are kind of slow moving um, might be a better long-term solution but um, elected officials respond to you know phone calls and constituents who are saying I don't want my, my kid to get shot tomorrow and they need to show evidence that we're doing something so that your kid doesn't get shot at school 
Um, and I think it's, it's maybe hard to explain in that context the, the slower moving things that you just described. So um, how, do you, um, how do you think we can make the case for what we should be doing that, that will work um, in a world where politicians need to show, hey, we took a vote, we did, you know, we did these things, and we're keeping your kids safe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say I think one thing we need to share with the public maybe is, um, is some of the data out there, right, about school safety. And I'm most familiar with LAUSD's data, and I know that, for example, the policy that Mauro mentioned, right, the mandatory daily random searches um, for weapons, for example, um, that policy, the data shows, is simply not effective, right? And so what we've seen uh, throughout many years of using this policy is that no guns were uncovered, right? But during that same time, guns were actually uncovered using other means, right? And other, like, more kind of traditional means of really, um, you know, looking for suspicious behavior, really paying attention, right, to, um, to the children, um, as well as the adults, right, on that campus. Um, and so I think that data can help us um, to really explain to parents that um, certain things simply don't seem to work. For example, one thing that I've heard uh, that you would think would be useful, right, is actually like having some drills for shootings, right, for um, f to prepare, right, for an active shooter. And I know that some schools have done that, but what I've been reading is that actually the effect of those is counterproductive. What ends up happening is that the kids are traumatized. They're constantly talking about when, when, and when, it's, when and where it's going to happen, um, and so they're um, they're actually hurting the kids more than they're helping them, right? Um, so I think that that's the unfortunate thing, right? Is that we have to be honest with ourselves um, and really, really share with the public that there aren't any easy solutions, right? But that we all have to be um, much more uh, proactive and in investing in our schools. Uh, we have ratios of, you know, counselor to kid that are just astronomical um, or counselor to, uh, excuse me, child uh, to psychologist. Um, I think one psychologist is supposed to, you know, take care of over 700 students, right? And like these things are just not realistic. Like that's, those are the things that need to change first and foremost. And then, of course, we need to support, um, you know, sensible gun reform, uh, which I do think educators have a really important role to play in. Um, and what we see um, is that schools that are doing um, this work effectively, they're also doing really um, helpful kind of threat assessments, right? And, and being proactive if they do hear of a student who has a particular fascination with weapons, right? Or if there is some incident of cyberbullying where there's a threat that's made, right? They actually make sure that they follow up on that information. Uh, and that they're talking to the appropriate authorities um, and, um, you know, and, and taking steps to, to make sure that that, that child does not harm um, their classmates. Yeah, so to piggyback off what of Julia's point, that there is good data out there, uh, especially in LAUSD. LAUSD about six years ago started implementing um, a school experience survey for students, for staff, and also for families. Um, for the students, among the numerous questions that they asked is, you know, do you feel safe at school? Um, how often do you see bullying going on? Now, this data is really good because over 90% of students get surveyed. Uh, at Mendes, for example, we've had above 90. We've had a couple years, we've had 100% student participation. So you're taking uh, the responses of a thousand students, eleven hundred students, and not just a small uh, group. And so, you know, when we at Mendes proclaim to families who we're trying to convince to bring their families to their their child to Mendes High School, and we proclaim that we have one of the safest campus in LAUSD, there's actually data to back that up. Um, you know, earlier Jeff introduced us by saying that students and staff at Mendes call Mendes the happiest place on earth. If Disney's listening, we actually say happiest place on the planet, <laughs> not happiest place on earth. <laughs> but we are so, Tra but trademark that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we have. Um, but the data backs it up. So, for example, uh, ninety-five percent. I think uh, in the last survey, about ninety-five percent of our students f said that they felt safe on campus and. Um, Last summer, LA School Report used the LA School Experience Survey to identify 
schools as green, blue, and red. Uh, green where students felt the safest, the next level was blue, and then red where students feel the, felt the le least safe. On the east side, Mendes High School was the only high school in green, uh, mm -hmm. even among uh, other high achieving magnets that exist uh, out there. Mm -hmm. And so that, that work, which data backs up, is not because of uh, random searches or a hard uh, discipline program, but it's because of some of the stuff that we've talked about. It's because of uh, being proactive and trying to get into classes and make presentations to the students before things uh, happen, uh, developing a co uh, school culture where students feel connected uh, and making sure that we have strong communication with, uh, with our families among different topics, but definitely about what's going on in school. This is what's happening at school on a daily basis to make sure that your son or daughter feels safe on campus. Mm -hmm. So in the case of the Parkland shooting this year, um, the shooter in that case had been suspended multiple times, uh, moved to different school, school sites, and uh, reports suggest that school administrators felt that their hands were a bit tied in mm -hmm. trying to find a place for him, but also dealing with the fact that legally they had to find, um, you know, legally they had to um, keep him enrolled in their schools. There's been years of, of discussion about reducing school suspensions and expulsions, and there's been some co controversy locally within Los Angeles about the role that um, restorative justice plays in trying to reduce discipline, but also uh, help these students find a, a healthy outlet. But at the same time, um, parents feeling that that policy actually doesn't punish the kids enough and keeps um, potential troublemakers on campus. And some parents feel that students who have a history of behavior problems shouldn't be on campus because they pose this threat to their son or daughter. So this balance between um, making sure that every student has access to um, an appropriate education, but also keeping other students safe. That's a difficult balance that a lot of schools have struggled with. Mm -hmm. um, in light of school violence and, and all the headlines this year, how do we really um, deal with this, these competing efforts to both keep dangerous individuals off campus, but at the same time provide education for every student regardless of their particular challenges? Mm -hmm. I think that's, um, you know, it's a particularly tough issue and it's, it's a great question, um, right, that you ask. Um, and I think that um, the key there, right, is that um, really this school uh, did what it could, right? And so, and, and, uh, and did remove the student um, from the school, which actually as restorative practitioners, um, we don't say that there should be zero suspensions and we should never expel a child, right? Um, but what we look at is, um, is common offenses such as willful defiance, right? Um, those kinds of things we believe are simply not um, suspendable offenses. Um, in, in our district, um, we have certain things that actually were, were mandated to expel and suspend for, right? But I think the key there really is that the expulsion is not the solution. You know, like what happens after the child is expelled from that one school, then they're gonna end up in another school and they're gonna cause harm there, right? right? Or they're gonna cause harm in the community, right? Uh, the problem is that that person was allowed to, to have access to a weapon and so I think as educators and as school communities, we really need to be advocating um, for more power to remove the weapons out of the hands of people who have a record um, of being dangerous, right? I mean, I think that this is, um, this really go goes beyond um, the school's scope in, ma in many ways. And, and I know that that's, um, that's an unfortunate thing, but I do think that that's the honest answer. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of um, guns on campuses and um, keeping those um, out of the, the campus, um, again, the, the school, I think, does what it can. Um, and we do have um, lots of situations um, where we've, we've, we've seen students bring weapons uh, to school. Sometimes they bring them for self-defense because they don't feel safe coming, walking from their home to the school. Uh, but other times we know that there are clear signs that they actually m uh, mean to cause some harm. Um, and that's when the school actually is allowed still um, to suspend the child uh, and even to expel the child. And so I think that that's, that's a myth about restorative justice, um, to be quite honest. And, um, and I think it's important for us to dispel those myths. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think um, Many of us who go into education and then become either school site educators or work at the district level, 
this, uh, district level educators. The great majority of us followed a very traditional path in which we were successful in school and then moved on either to junior college or four year, graduated and then pursued our career, whether education was our first career or education became a second or third career, but eventually we landed as educators. Uh, there's very few, at least I've, I've met very few educators who followed alternative paths. Mm. And I think it makes it very difficult to then empathize with students who are struggling. And I'm not just talking about students who are struggling because they seem to pose an imminent threat, but just even students who just struggle in school, period, and then therefore act up, and then um, it seems like the easy fix is to be really hard discipline-wise and possibly suspend or, or, or move. Um, but Julia made a point earlier that I think is critical, and that is when you begin to look at our struggling students and you look at, you start uncovering the layers, you discover that many times these students need extra support that have just not been yet identified. Um, and Julia earlier mentioned that something that is not a, a fixed, slow moving or five years from now is being able to provide schools with more counselors, um, psychiatric social workers, uh, uh, PSAs, uh, PSA is a LAUSD uh, vocabulary word, but it probably exists in other districts as well, which is an attendance counselor. And then also connect, going back to uh, family and community engagement, this is where the, the community piece in family and community engagement becomes key because if you can tap into community resources that are offered that add to what the school is offering or possibly even offer a service that the school is not offering, it helps those uh, struggling students. And so I think the more that we try to understand why a child is getting five fails in one C or why a child is acting up in the class and it's a behavior problem and being able to support that student as best we can, I think that's more beneficial to the student and the school community as a whole instead of trying to quickly discipline or suspend. Now, when students do seem to pose an imminent danger, as Julia mentioned, um, and as the articles mentioned too, uh, recently there's been an emphasis on threat assessments where you bring a whole team together, um, and that's where the school can work with uh, the local district. The local district, at least uh, for Mendes, has been very helpful when we have had to make threat assessments. We've gotten support from the local districts, and uh, I've been able to, I think, make some uh, proper decisions in terms of what, what are the next steps with those particular students. But also to a point that Julia made, when we have discovered weapons on campus at Mendes High School, um, it, ha it has been because students have the ones that have informed us. Uh, they have let a teacher know, they have sent us an anonymous tip, or uh, they let some other staff member know, whether it be a campus aide or, or a community rep, they let, they let them know because students too, they, they understand that uh, if, if someone wins, brings a weapon to campus, it's just bad news all around. And mm -hmm. they do so, you know, not, not necessarily get the, the student in trouble, but just to make sure that everybody's safe. And then it's our responsibility to make sure that we, we address the needs of these students who are struggling academically, struggling behaviorally, or who pose an imminent danger to the school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm so glad you said that. Um, I think uh, I want to ask you this this last question to um, to get your thinking on. I'll give you a second to to think while I share a little a little tiny story. Um, you know, so much of what I think we hear about uh, this issue is, um, you know, we need to harden facilities. We need to do all these things to and around the kids and teachers in order to solve this problem. When as a principal, uh, you know, the best and most effective deterrent to incidents of violence in school. 95 or more percent of the time in my experience was other students or um, maybe staff members who live in the community or parents coming in and saying hey heads up there's this issue happening 
you need to go talk to so-and-so or um, you know someone brought something to school that we're concerned about um, and that that was how we prevented almost all of the incidents that um, either were definitely going to become a violent incident or could have happened and then escalated into mm -hmm. Uh, a potentially violent incident, either at the school site or you know at dismissal time or across the street in the in the projects or those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And so, um, if there was one thing that I wish that folks in the public or policymakers could know, it's that you know our best solution to this might actually just be like talking to the kids, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, which sounds kind of so too simple to be true, but. Um, you know, I, I think we we maybe dismiss the power of that um, when we're talking about policy. So I'm wondering from your perspective, if there was one thing that you could tell policymakers or parents or the media, tell those who who uh, maybe don't work in schools every day, um, you know, this is something we could do uh, that would really help. What what might that be for you? Hmm. I have something in mind, and I, I think the one thing that I would um, want folks to know out there, whether they be parents or educators or administrators or policymakers, really, um, is that uh, we have to recognize as a society, and this is really the key philosophy um, that restorative justice stems from, we have to recognize that those who are intent on causing harm or who have caused harm need healing as well. Right, so not just the victims are gonna need healing, but those who are at risk of causing harm, really we need to focus first and foremost on their healing. Um, and that's, that's something that is not easy, but I think that the stigma around mental health, uh, which does still unfortunately exist in many communities, um, that is one way that we need to really begin to listen to the warning signs that we see in children, right? Uh, we need to not hide them and not be embarrassed by them, right? And we need to really seek help uh, in the school um, can really become, and in the more successful schools, right? Become centers of the community where not only students, but also parents um, feel safe coming to the school and asking for support, right? If they have a child who is, um, you know, showing some signs of, um, of distress. And we know that the people who hurt others have a lot of um, hurt inside of them um, and that that is usually the, um, the cause, right, of, of them wanting to harm others. Um, we know that a lot of the children who have committed these shootings were bullied themselves, were isolated. Isolation is something that I think we really need to work on in our schools. Um, some schools are doing really creative things, making sure that they do all kinds of wonderful things like no one eats alone campaigns, anti-bullying campaigns, right, um, to really make sure that we're addressing um, the, the needs of children, the social and emotional needs of children, um, which I think also um, can support, you know, not only um, a safe culture and a safe campus, but also their academic achievement. Being um, part of LAUSD, my, my message would be to uh, LAUSD policymakers. Um, number one, I would ask you to get rid of the daily random wanding, it doesn't work. And, and in place of that, uh, at Mendes High School the last two years, we've tested something that this year we're going to go full out once, once a day, which is a, a random survey where we go into a classroom. Mm -hmm. The survey takes about five minutes. And students are asked questions such as, um, is, is, there a, is there a particular place on campus where you feel unsafe? If yes, where? Uh, if yes, when usually? Uh, do, you f do you feel bullied at school? If yes, where? If yes, when? And then it, it gives the students an opportunity to just make random comments or, or comments. That we feel is much more helpful because if students do feel a threat, it's anonymous. And I think students will speak up and say yes. But then you also learn other stuff, which the district also wants to prevent. So students may, for example, tell us in the comment section, yeah, the restroom in the T building runs out of toilet paper early in the morning and no one ever puts any more, <laughs> which is an important component of being a feeling w good in school. Yeah. Or they might say, hey, just a heads up, this particular student and this particular adult are meeting 
every day during lunch is the two of them, which is important to know uh, as well. And it's, it's done where students don't have to be afraid of snitching because it's anonymous. Instead of pulling four students out of a classroom and um, making them feel like they've done something wrong when they haven't done anything wrong, uh, invading their, their private space. Another, in, instead of that, what you have, uh, the teacher will know ahead of time that you're coming in to do this survey, which is online, it's on a, it's on a computer, is that all 35, all 30, all 37 students participate and they have an opportunity to share their thoughts and concerns in regards to school safety on campus and anything else that they want to share as well. I think that would be a much more powerful policy than the one that's currently happening in LAUSD. Mm -hmm. All right, well, uh, first of all, I just want to uh, thank both of our guests today, uh, Yulia Zubak and uh, Mauro Bautista. Uh, it's, I think there's so much wisdom and experience in what you've shared today. and. Um, really perspective that, that I think has not been at the forefront of our national discourse. So uh, thank you so much for, uh, for giving your time and joining us today. And uh, for our audience, if you'd like to hear a little bit more from Yulia and Mauro, um, check out our episode extras, which will be available on our website, aotashow.com. Um, we'll have some additional conversation with both of these guests. You'll learn a little more about them and the great work they're doing uh, here in the Los Angeles area. So again, that's the website, aotashow.com. All right, dope seminar. Yeah. That was a yeah. fantastic discussion on school safety, and this is definitely an issue that's not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, definitely chime in with your thoughts on um, any of the content that we've shared so far. Uh, and also remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can catch all the latest videos from all of the above. But now it's time for our assessment segment, Jeffrey, what are you going to assess for us today? Well, uh, Manuel, it's summertime. And when you say summer and kids, many of you might have an image of summer camp or family vacation or climbing trees and playing outside come to mind. Now, these are powerful and important images. I remember loving summertime as a kid. The long days meant more time outside and no school meant more opportunity for playtime with friends and kids in the neighborhood. And if you grew up in the Garrett household, those long Minnesota summer days also meant our strict eight o'clock bedtime had us hitting the sack with sunlight still peeking through the windows and sounds of other kids still playing in the street. Thanks, mom and dad. But romantic notions aside, there is a lot more happening or perhaps not happening during the summer than we often think. Teachers have long commented on the impact of summer learning loss, or what's sometimes called the summer slide. This is the phenomenon of students going home for the summer and then returning to school in the fall, having forgotten the good portion of the skills and content that they'd learned the prior year. And as it turns out, teachers have been right all these years. A plethora of studies published over the last century, yeah, we've known about this for a while now, have identified that summer loss is not only a real measurable thing, but that it is far more powerful than our level of response would suggest. In a 2007 longitudinal study, study published by researchers Carl Alexander, Doris Entweisel, and Linda Olson from Johns Hopkins, found that the effects of summer loss are not only sharp, but lasting, and that they compound over time. The researchers began monitoring the educational progress of Baltimore school children chosen randomly in 1982 and tracked them through the age of 22. Their key findings included students from wealthier and poorer backgrounds tend to actually make similar gains during the school year, but during the summer, disadvantaged students fall significantly behind, and by the time a student gets to high school, the cumulative effect of summer loss means that nearly two thirds of the reading achievement gap can be explained by unequal access to summer learning opportunities during elementary school. The researchers also found that summer loss continues to affect children through high school and into college, creating barriers to entry into rigorous college preparatory courses like APs, 
and influencing students who struggle to drop out or to fail to pursue college. This data is pretty shocking. What the heck is happening all across this country from June to August that is resulting in a large portion of our massive achievement gaps? Well, the answer is that the summer is perhaps the most unequal time of year for children in America. While low-income students are losing ground in reading and, frankly, losing even more ground in math, their more affluent peers are not only not slipping, but in many cases making academic gains during the summer months. This massive disparity can be largely attributed to the growing economic divide in our country. While students in poor community communities are lucky if they get to attend summer enrichment programs, parents in affluent communities invest heavily in such experiences for their kids. These investments include summer travel, trips to museums and the theater, summer camp, academic programs at college campuses, even direct tutoring, athletics, internships, vacations, and more. And at the same time, we know from extensive research that low-income students are not only not getting nearly the level of exposure to these experiences that their wealthier peers get, but they're grappling with a toxic soup of challenges in its place. Food insecurity and hunger, weight gain, that's right, studies have shown that our kids get more obese during the summer, and troublesome exposure to neighborhood violence and the policing that follows are just a few of these ingredients in the toxic soup. The summer is, no exaggeration, the time when the rich get richer while vacationing and the poor get poorer while trying to not be irrevocably harmed by their life circumstance. Unless you think this is a small issue, about half of the kids in public schools in our nation come from low-income families. So, that's a lot to digest. What do we do about it? Thankfully, there is no shortage of ideas out there about how to tackle this difficult problem. First, some states, districts, and charter school organizations have taken the approach that the solution is to lengthen the school day and school year. This is a logical approach that essentially says if kids need more time in school to avoid falling behind or to get caught up, then we need to provide more time in school. Eight-hour school days, lengthened school years, and even modified year-round school calendars are just some of the ideas that have been put into place. And in many cases, these ideas bear fruit. Now, critics would say that this is a strategy that actually punishes low-income students with endless, drill-and-kill style schooling that can even be counterproductive. And there's some reason to fear that for sure. But if done well, and kids aren't just pounded with reading and math, this could be an important part of the solution. Second, we can boost funding for after-school and summer programming in low-income schools and communities. States and the federal government have tried this, though the efforts have fallen far short of providing equal opportunity for low-income students. But hey, if we want schools to fix poverty, then let's fund them and the community programs that support our schools like they're literally the front lines of a war on poverty. Unfortunately, as luck would have it, Donald, Betsy, and Republicans in D.C. are actively attempting to cut funding to federal programs like the 21st Century Community Learning Centers program, which funds just the kinds of programs low-income communities desperately need. Yeah, let that sink in for a minute. Third, there is a strong call for a public health campaign to combat summer loss. Families are doing their best to support their kids, and they may not be aware of the extent of this particular issue. And while backpacking in France may not be affordable for everyone, there are local institutions in many communities which families could access and use to combat summer loss. Visits to the library, discussions about learning at home with adults, giving kids puzzles to solve and projects to manage, and even work experiences that require reading or writing or problem solving can help kids retain and strengthen their skills over the summer months. So, we're not short on solutions, but right now we do seem to be short on the will to act. So, if you're feeling motivated knowing that there's this problem and we have the resources to fix it, but we're just not, then start by sharing this video. 
Call your elected officials, ask about enrichment programming available in your area, and let them know that this is an issue that matters to you. Support organizations that are doing this important work right in your community. The National Summer Learning Association has a website with lots of resources on it, and there's always your local YMCA or Boys and Girls Club and dozens of other agencies doing great summer programming for kids that you can join or donate to or support in other ways. And frankly, even better yet, get involved with a young person in your life and help them find meaningful summer enrichment and after-school programming. Sometimes the solutions to these big, complex problems that may feel overwhelming are actually a bit closer to our fingertips than we might think. Wow, Jeff. Um, first of all, I feel like you're trying to take away my summer, my summer break, my summer vacation. <laughs> um, man, honestly, that your um, assessment there just reminds me of just how many different ways that um, the economic divide in this country contributes to the achievement gap and how many different ways that students from low-income backgrounds are set at a disadvantage. Of all the ways that um, growing up in a low-income household um, sets you up for extra challenges that higher-income students um, don't have, summer loss, I think, is one of the last ones to be thought of. I mean, it's not one that comes to mind when I think about it, um, you know, but the research is clear, as you said. Um, this is contributing to a huge gap. I remember my first year teaching, I had um, two students in particular that I gave information for this um, summer camp at uh, Ivy League University, and um, it was a great opportunity, and both these students were, like, perfect for, the, for this particular camp. And um, I remember one telling me, like, as much as she would love to go, there's no way she could afford it. And just as a first-year teacher, that was one of the first times that I, you know, myself really thought about, like, damn, man, there's great opportunities out there that are being missed by students who simply can't afford it. And while they languish in their you know, bedroom or, or front yards for the summer, um, there are students whose families can't afford it. And those students are going out there and getting these awesome experiences, coming back in the fall, like really ready to go. And you know, it's just uh, another tragic reminder that um, the economic challenges facing um, a lot of our communities are having these impacts that are above and beyond being able to tell somebody like, oh, just work harder, you'll be all right. Like grit, just like get yourself through it. Like, no, there's all these different ways that growing up in a low income uh, household sets you back and you know summer loss is just one of the many and I hope yeah. you know I hope people uh, share this story and and uh, visit those resources that you mentioned to see how they could contribute at least in their own communities to help make sure that um, students have something productive to do to contribute to their learning and combat this summer loss yeah I you know doing the research for this piece it really struck me that that schools can't do it alone um, and so you know maybe we can lengthen the school year and those sorts of things but uh, you know, we need other wraparound services uh, to support great programming and enrichment opportunities for kids that aren't just more school, but are fun, interesting, engaging things, the arts, athletics, right. and these opportunities to stimulate and help these young, brilliant minds continue to grow and develop, uh, you know, even outside of the school day and the school year. Um, it can be done. We just, we have to invest in it. Okay. Yeah. All right, another great episode in the books. Great seminar, fantastic contribution for our show and tell. So shout out again to Nadia uh, for bringing her third grade portfolio. And lastly, we want to hit you with a real quick shout out. We love to shout out the students of March for Our Lives, yes. many of whom are survivors of the Parkland shooting. And they are currently spending this summer on a 60 day, 20 state, 75 stop mm. summer bus tour to register young people to vote. While the internet and cable news is full of folks who are willing to give their two cents about school safety and gun legislation, here are some young folks going out there and actually doing something about it. Nothing makes us teachers more proud of students than when they go out into the world and take an active role in shaping the future of our great nation. So shout out to March for Our Lives and their Road to Change summer activism. Mm, yes, absolutely. Cosign completely on that. Uh, folks, make sure you check out our website uh, for all of our content. That's aotashow.com. Again, aotashow.com. We'll see you next time.